Here's what's ahead on this week's Investing Insights. Apple exceeded expectations in its fiscal second quarter. Hear why Morningstar remains cautious about the tech company's future. Plus, a game changer has shaken up. Active ETF Investing, the editor of Morningstar ETF Investor Newsletter, will join the podcast to discuss the new frontier and spotlight some favorite active ETFs and how investors can use an investment strategy called asset location to their benefit. This is Investing Insights. Welcome to Investing Insights. I'm your host, Ivana Hampton. And let's get started with a look at the Morningstar headlines. Apple's fiscal second quarter results surpassed expectations. iPhone sales and services like the App Store and iCloud outperform but revenue declined 3%, with a drop in iPad and Mac sales in the March quarter. Morningstar had been anticipating a slowdown of strong growth in hardware products. Remote work and school and the initial rollout of 5G boosted demand for several years. Morningstar is pleased with the iPhone and services segment's modest growth, despite other areas falling on a year-over-year basis. The analyst remains cautious, about the next several quarters for Apple as macroeconomic headwinds persist. However, the tech titan should fare better than many of its smartphone peers. Morningstar is maintaining its $150 estimate of Apple's stock and views shares as overvalued. SoFi Technologies benefited from more deposits and rising interest rates in the first quarter. Morningstar thinks both help the digital bank deliver strong net interest income or what a bank earns from making loans. However, revenue growth slowed company-wide. SoFi reported a net revenue increase of 43% year-over-year. It climbed to $472 million. Revenue growth is outpacing expenses, with the per-share loss gap narrowing compared to last year. SoFi's lending segment is its largest source of revenue because of net interest income's growth. The larger deposit base has allowed the company to make more loans. Overall, the lender has made more loans, but seeing contraction in some areas like student loans and the number of new student loans has declined compared to last year. Student loan forbearance and higher interest rates have hit the area hard. SoFi is counting on the recent acquisition of Wyndham Capital to help resolve loan processing issues. Morningstar is sticking with its $14 estimate of SoFi stock and thinks it's undervalued. Ford's first quarter earnings beat estimates. It's adjusted 63 cents per share topped the 41 cents prediction. That was the Wall Street analyst average. Morningstar thinks macroeconomic fears beyond management's control may be holding Ford's stock back. The automaker confirmed but didn't raise its 2023 outlook. Unlike rival GM, which recently did, Ford's end of quarter balance sheet seems to be in solid shape to handle recession risk. Its total available funds sit at more than $46 billion, and management expects strong pricing headwinds for the rest of the year, especially in the four blue segment. The division consists of gas-powered and hybrid vehicles not sold to commercial customers. The commercial four pro segment saw year-over-year pricing gains, and it should do well this year with the launch of the new Super Duty pickup and continued sale of software. Morningstar expects cost headwinds to improve as 2023 unfolds because the bulk of last year's cost increases came after the first quarter. However, macro uncertainty, lower for credit income, and rising loan losses will likely create challenges. Morningstar still estimates Ford stock is worth $20 and considers it undervalued. Crypto exchange platform Coinbase reported improved first quarter results better cryptocurrency market conditions, increased interest income, and cost-cutting efforts help reduce losses. First quarter net revenue fell from last year, but increased from last quarter to almost $773 million. Meanwhile, the company paired its first quarter net loss to $79 million from a loss of $430 million last year. Coinbase revenue growth came from its trading business and subscription and service segment. Pricing drove trading revenues increased and not volume. That remained flat from last quarter. Major cost-cutting puts the firm's spending on much better footing. And while painful, Morningstar sees these reductions as necessary 
In difficult market conditions, Coinbase is facing regulatory uncertainty due to SEC scrutiny and remains exposed to volatile cryptocurrency markets. Morningstar still thinks Coinbase shares are worth $80 and are undervalued, although a wide range of outcomes are possible with the stock. A game changer is providing more opportunities for investors. Many active managers are launching active ETFs to remain relevant. So, what's happening with this so-called space race? Brian Armour is the Director of Passive Strategies Research for North America for Morningstar Research Services. He's also the editor of the Morningstar ETF Investor Newsletter. Brian, you've written about how active managers have flocked to active ETFs in recent years. What brought about the change? Yeah, so five years ago, there were 11 strategies, active ETFs with uh, over a billion dollars in assets under management. And 10 of those 11 were in fixed income and they were in, you know, ultra short bonds, bank loans, more like niche strategies. Um, So there wasn't wide adoption. And then in 2019, the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission uh, uh, adopted the ETF rule. And the biggest takeaway from that was um, that that, uh, issuers are able to use custom creation and redemption baskets. So, you know, most people trade on the secondary market. Um, when they trade ETFs, but the real advantages of ETFs come in the primary market. And in in the primary markets, the authorized participant um, makes an exchange with the issuer, which is basically they give a um, a basket of securities that they exchange in kind for ETF shares. And that's a creation. Then the redemption would be they would give their ETF shares back and receive securities uh, from the portfolio. And so five years ago, APs were required to use like a pro rata slice. So, um, you know, it had to mimic the actual portfolio of the ETF. And when they created shares, that's what they handed in. When they redeemed shares, that's what they got back. And then with the ETF rule, that changed to where uh, portfolio managers were able to set what those baskets included. Um, And it didn't have to match the portfolio. And that gave, um, you know, increased you know, abilities to manage taxes, and then also uh, more portfolio management capabilities. And so that was a big game changer for active managers. So where does the ETF market stand today in terms of assets under management and strategies? Yeah, so there are thousands of strategies overall. Um, There's uh, $7 trillion in ETFs. Um, About 5.5% of that is in active ETFs. Um, I think where you, we've seen faster organic growth in active ETFs than the rest of the ETF market. Um, So we expect that market share for active ETFs to continue to grow. Um, But, you know, what we saw in 2022 was about trillion dollars of uh, investors' money flow out of active mutual funds and about $90 billion flow into active ETFs. So um, it's pretty clear investors are, are seeing better opportunities in active ETFs right now. So you're really seeing a, a shift yeah. within this space. So Morningstar talks about how investors would benefit from a diversified, low-cost portfolio with a solid track record. How would an investor practice diversification while also investing in active ETFs? Yeah, so I mean, we definitely talk about it a lot, having diversified, low-cost portfolios. But um, active ETFs, active strategies in general, uh, you know, diversification – benefit is a little murkier. So the sort of the the counterpoint to diversification is investors wouldn't want a manager's 101st best idea um, diluting the portfolio. So there's really two different approaches. Um, and it's it depends on the strategy, but there are two different approaches. So that sort of a top-down approach, which is you take a market portfolio, you tilt it towards um, characteristics that you see as providing an edge over the long term. Um, and then the o- other approach is bottom up approach, which is, you know, based on really company specific research that the manager is performing and, and sort of selecting individual stocks um, one at a time. And so with the former top top down, you want a diversified portfolio where you can capture the market beta and tilt towards your advantage um, with the, the bottom up uh, side of things. You know, you just have to be careful because um, even when you have a good odds of success, you can still lose um, when when 
concentrated strategies like that um, if, if you don't size your bets properly. So what can costs tell us about a fund's success? Yeah, so costs are the most reliable predictor of a fund success that we found in our research. And, um, you know, Morningstar Active Passive Barometer, the most recent version, found that the cheapest quintile of funds uh, within a category um, had twice, double the odds of success against the average passive peer um, over the most expensive quintile funds. So fees are, are critical no matter what area of the market, what strategy you're going after. And Jack Bogle, I think, said it best when he said, um, in investing, you, you get what you don't pay for. That's important to remember. Now, your article warned investors, you know, they should not chase performance because there's risk of bubbles, right, popping up. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah. So the go-to example would be ARK Innovation ETF. And, you know, taking a step back, the disadvantage, the, the only risk that ETFs, active ETFs have versus an active mutual fund is capacity constraints um, because uh, mutual funds can close to new investors. ETFs can't. And so um, our innovation ETF ran into an issue where they had incredible performance in 2020, gathered huge assets in 2020 and, and the following year. Um, and you know, they, they couldn't close to new investors, and it was a concentrated portfolio of smaller companies uh, for the most part. And so what happened is you saw the tail wagging the dog in that scenario where, um, you know, the price to book, the valuations of the, the companies within the portfolio on average doubled in 2020. Um, so it, it was sort of unsustainable uh, price increase, and and in 2022, we, we saw investors pay for it. So those that came in late um, got absolutely crushed in, in 2022. Were there any signs, like if you were an investor in that, to know, hey, I should pull out now? Yeah, I mean, going back to fundamentals is always good. It's easy to get caught up in the narrative and the hype, but when you see something at an unsustainably high uh, price compared to the fundamentals of the companies it holds, uh, that's a huge red flag. All right. So what are some ETFs that have received Morningstar Analyst ratings of silver or gold? What are your favorites? Yeah, so one of the best developments coming out of active ETFs is the the influx of great mutual fund managers that were sort of like holding off to adopt the ETF structure uh, until the ETF rule came along. So we have five different asset managers that currently have funds receiving a silver or gold rating. Um, and uh, those include Dimensional Fund Advisors, um, Fidelity, uh, PIMCO, T. Rowe Price, and J.P. Morgan. And so uh, within those strategies, uh, we see a lot of time-tested time tra strategies that have done really well in the mutual fund industry and, and brought over to, the, to ETFs. And um, so three uh, that I'm just going to mention right now, uh, the Dimensional Core Equity 2 ETF, uh, which holds, you know, when we were talking about the top-down approach, it holds uh, 2,500 stocks and, and basically just tilts towards uh, lower valuations, higher profitability, um, and, and smaller size. And, and so they see those as long-term advantages um, and, and it comes with a low cost of 17 basis points. So very well diversified low cost portfolio. Um, another one is the Fidelity Total Bond ETF, and that one holds um, about 2,500 bonds, including treasuries, corporates, um, and, and securitized debt. And so that, that's another diversified portfolio that has a little bit more flexibility than other passive options, and it's shown up in performance. Um, it's, it's about top 10 percentile um, over the past five years. Um, and then the third strategy is T. Rowe Price um, Blue Chip Growth ETF, which, um, you know, T. Rowe Price has long been a leader in growth uh, strategies. Um, and and bringing it into ETF form, it just gives the investors another opportunity sort of a, a across the board between value, um, growth, core and, and all sorts of different strategies, but this one only holds about 75 um, companies. And so it, it's better to use this as a, in a supporting role to more core um, strategies within your portfolio. All right. Well, Brian, thank you for this conversation and identify three 
ETFs as our own high marks for Morningstar. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank you. Investors, like home buyers, may want to consider location when deciding where their assets will live. Check out this conversation about the best practices for tax efficient portfolio management. Here are Morningstar Inc.'s Director of Personal Finance, Christine Benz, and financial planning expert, Michael Kitsis. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. The topic of asset location, not to be confused with asset allocation, has gained new importance now that yields are higher. I recently sat down with financial planning expert Michael Kitsis to discuss how investors and their advisors should approach that question. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. My pleasure. Appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to talk about asset location, where to hold different types of assets, assuming I have Mm -hmm. multiple account types. This was a topic that was kind of hard to get excited about when (laughs) yields were so low. It's like, well, what difference does it make, really, if someone is getting a 1% yield or 2% yield on their bonds? But now that we are meaningfully higher with income, which, of course, is taxed at ordinary income tax, Tax rates. Can you share some thoughts on that asset location question? Yeah, asset location to me has, has kind of gone through an interesting evolution over the past like sort of twenty odd years that there's really been a growing focus on. Because if we if we go back to the 1990s, well, you know, we only we only made Roths in the late 1990s, and frankly, mm-hmm. IRAs and 401ks were still kind of in their early stages of gaining momentum. Then it's it's really the past twenty years that. We've seen much bigger IRA and 401k balances. We've gotten more ways to move money in and out of retirement accounts. The overall contribution limits have gotten bigger, so we're able to get more dollars in there. And we got this third bucket of tax-free Roth that the asset location decision on the one hand has become more complex, and on the other hand means there's actually just literally more dollars and more opportunity to do this well. Like I have more money in more buckets to choose from. More choices means more economic benefit if I get this right, and conversely, like more economic harm if I get this wrong. So when I look at these asset location decisions overall, the the basic rule for this usually is pretty straightforward. Uh, Anything that's ordinary income may as well go inside of an IRA because it's going to be ordinary income no matter what, whether you draw it out of an IRA or it's taxed in a taxable account. But at least if you put it in an IRA, it's tax deferred and you can control the timing of when this gets recognized into the future when you take a withdrawal instead of today. And so that usually led to some kind of basic rule of thumb like bonds that generate ordinary income go inside of the IRA and stocks that generate capital gains go in brokerage accounts so that you still get the capital gains treatment. The problem with that though, and we, we published a lot of research around this back in the early 2010s when, uh, when interest rates got so low, I mean, right, coming off financial crisis down a near zero for a while and barely 2% on on intermediate treasuries, the yields got so low that the irony is, you know, taking a low yielding uh, investment and putting in a tax deferred account doesn't actually really do much for you. Like the, the, you know, the, the difference between tax deferred compounding growth versus not tax deferred compounding growth on two is not actually that much different. Like there's just not that much compounding that happens when the yield base is so low in the first place. Like, you know, compounding is, is a very powerful thing in the long run, but compounding low numbers only compound so far. Compounding big numbers compound at much bigger levels. And because of that, what we actually found in our research is that uh, uh, because the yields were so low and there was so little benefit to get tax deferred compounding growth on bonds, it was often actually better to put stocks inside of the IRAs, even though you might convert capital gains to ordinary income because you could get tax deferred growth for very long time periods, right? If I look practically from any investor's portfolio, even those of us that tend to buy and hold, most people I know who are even buy and hold oriented, if I pull out their portfolio today and I say, oh, this is really cool, like show me what you had in 1993, it's not the same. Like just investment markets were different. ETFs barely existed. We lived in a mutual fund world. You couldn't even buy it on an online platform because that didn't exist. Like just like the nature of markets themselves change. And from time to time, funds change, offerings change. And even if you take, I'll call like a very low turnover portfolio, like a 10% turnover portfolio. uh, So we're only changing investments once a decade on average. If we actually look at how that adds up over 30 plus years, 
once a decade turnover still drags so much lost return over multi-decade time periods that we found for investors with really long time horizons, it was still better to put the stocks inside the IRA, give up the capital gains treatment Hmm. to avoid the tax drag of even very low turnover. And to the extent you've got anything that's a dividend yield, right, if you're getting a portion of returns and dividends instead of uh, capital or appreciation, that's essentially like forced turnover. You have no control. You have no control. It is coming through. You are getting taxed on it, which means you are experiencing the tax drag that goes with it. Again, usually preferential qualified dividend rates, but it's an annual tax drag that, again, gets a little more turbocharged inside of an IRA. And so we found for investors with long time horizons, the yields on bonds were low enough that there was some value to putting stocks inside of IRAs and getting that tax deferred compounding growth. Now, however, our investment realm starts to shift. Right now we're seeing bond yields are are getting higher and suddenly the value of tax deferred compounding growth when I might get five plus looks very different than tax deferred compounding growth when I was getting two. And so one of the things even that that you know we've always done with clients within our firm is revisiting asset location on an ongoing basis. I, you know, I kind of think of this as like, you can make the priority list of what's most important to put in the IRA, what's most important to put into the brokerage account. And as your investment views or investment assumptions or just the investment environment changes, so too does the nature of the priority list. Right? Maybe I'm more bullish on something and I think it's really got a great return opportunity, so I'm pushing it out to the Roth and then like it appreciates a lot and all of a sudden I'm not as excited about it anymore and maybe I don't necessarily want it in the Roth. Or in this case, maybe I was not so excited about putting my bonds in the IRA because it actually wasn't worth much to get tax deferred compounding growth. I may as well leave it in a brokerage account. If I'm tax sensitive, I'll just buy a muni bond in the brokerage account. Now suddenly as yields are higher, well, wait, putting bonds inside of the IRA starts to look more appealing again. And so the, the, the nature of asset location to me is it just, it is actually something that is more dynamic mm-hmm. than often we've given a credit for with the simple rule of thumb of like bonds in the IRA because they're already ordinary income and stocks in the brokerage account because they're already capital gains. The relative weightings of these investments means the optimal location as you're adding new dollars can actually shift over time. Like that's part of the nature of how this works. Well, Michael, this has been such a helpful discussion. We've covered a, a ton of ground. Thank Absolutely. you so much for being here. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Christine and Michael. Subscribe to Morningstar's YouTube channel to see new videos about investment ideas. You can hear market trends and analyst insights from Morningstar on your Alexa devices. Say, play Morningstar. Thanks to senior video producer Jake Vankerson. And thank you for tuning in to Investing Insights. I'm Ivana Hampton, a senior multimedia editor here at Morningstar. Take care.